Good morning. My name is Sarah Howard. I'm the Youth and Community Services Manager here at the Daniel Boone Regional Library. And we're here uh, with BPI and more particularly presenter Rebecca Evers. And she's going to talk to us about overcoming your child's medical appointment fears. And, you know, the first trip or maybe even the second trip can be can be a scary one. So she's going to take us through some resources to help with that. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat and she can address those at the end. And so right now I'm going to magically disappear so that she can share her screen and all the lovely information with you. So thanks for being here. Take it away. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here and we'll we'll get started. All right. Make sure I present from the beginning. That might be helpful. All right. Well, like um, Sarah had mentioned, today we're going to discuss um, some strategies and um, resources in helping, you know, you help your child overcome those medical appointment fears. So before we begin, as Sarah mentioned, my name is Rebecca Abers. I am a board certified behavior analyst in um, Columbia, Missouri here. I'm also a licensed behavior analyst in Missouri as well. Um, all right, so we'll go ahead and kind of get started. So within um, today's presentation, we have a few objectives that I kind of want to lay out before we get started. Um, the first one is to simply identify, you know, the four steps that we laid out to overcoming those medical appointment fears. Um, the next is to identify some of those related strategies. And then finally, I want to discuss um, other applications of these strategies. So a lot of these strategies will be applicable beyond um, just these medical appointments. And we'll talk about some other applications as we um, go through the presentation. All right, so first and foremost, medical appointment challenges. What do these you know, kind of look like for your kiddo? So these appointment challenges and fears are really common among you know, children and some adults as well. Um, going to the dentist is not my favorite activity. I wouldn't say that I have fears, but sometimes I do have some challenges along the way. Um, and not only for, you know, typically developing children and adults, um, those, de those diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder may present those extra challenges um, because of any, you know, sensory needs, communication needs, or other symptoms that may just be present because of the necessity of the appointment. For example, um, maybe a child with autism um, may present extra symptoms if they are, you know, dealing with some sort of pain, whether that is a dental, um, you know, dental related pain, or, you know, maybe we're just sick and we have to go into the doctor. Um, and, you know, why is this, you know, socially significant? Well, those challenges that may be presented in those medical appointments can lead these appointments to being unproductive and, and even put us in some unsafe situations. Uh, for example, if your child is going in for a shot and, you know, they're engaging in some sort of challenging behavior or they're unable to sit still, that could be potentially a dangerous situation to find, you know, yourself in, the medical professional in, as well as your child. Um, and this is applicable across different medical appointments, different medical um, professions as well. Um, I've mentioned a little bit about, you know, doctor appointments as well as dental appointments. And that's what we'll really focus on today. However, as I mentioned, these strategies and, and these fears are applicable across many different situations. All right, so when, you know, we decided to tackle the, you know, steps in overcoming um, medical appointment fears, I laid out these four simple steps that I think are, you know, the best way to tackle this situation. Um, the first one is simply to assess the situation. What is going on currently? The second is going to be to plan for success. The third is to practice those skills. And then the fourth one is to generalize or practice that skill in a more natural setting. And we'll talk about each of these in detail moving forward. All right, so that first step, as we said, is to simply assess the situation. As I mentioned, this is you know, getting down to the root of what is currently happening in these situations. If this is a situation that you've never seen your child in, maybe it's that first trip to the dentist or that first trip to the doctor for a shot, 
you might not know what it currently looks like. However, if this is a situation you've found your child in um, you know, several times and you know what that typically looks like, then I kind of want you to take a step back and kind of assess. So are there challenging behaviors that are happening? Is your kiddo engaging in um, avoidant behavior such as tantrums or moving their body away from the practitioner? Um, is your child engaging in elopement from the room? Is your child engaging in aggression in order to get out of doing those things? Um, these are all really good things for you to be aware of before then we practice that situation. Um, the next part of kind of assessing the situation is to identify those steps that are involved in the procedure or the appointment. So taking you know that step back again what steps in that process are going to be required does your child struggle with the entire idea of the appointment walking into the waiting room checking in waiting for their turn um, or is it more specifically the actual medical procedure that they're struggling with um, maybe it's you know getting their teeth brushed in the dental office that is you know what they're most struggling with um, kind of identifying what steps that they are struggling with, as well as what are the parts of the visit that your child does tolerate well. Um, maybe walking into the waiting room and checking in, saying hi to the receptionist and going to sit down with their favorite book or their favorite activity, that is something that they do really, really well. So not only do we want to identify those areas of if, improvement, but we also want to identify what parts are going well, which parts can we celebrate along the way. Um, the final point there is, you know, again, does your child have the skills that are necessary for the visit? Um, oftentimes, we just put our, ch our child in the situation, and we don't take that step back to see, you know, do they have the ability to follow those simple instructions that the provider is giving? Things such as, you know, open your mouth or sit down or, um, you know, put your hand on your head. Do they have those sort of um, skills necessary for that? Um, other skills that might be necessary for one of these visits might be, you know, sitting in one place for a longer period of time or waiting appropriately for, um, you know, the promised reinforcer or, you know, activity that they get at the end. Um, keeping in mind that that is also a really big skill involved in these appointments. And then finally, um, does your child have the ability to respond to questions? Is the child you know, orienting their body towards the practitioner? Are they able to answer those questions by themselves? You know, can you tell me you know, where it hurts or can you show me X, Y, and Z? Those are some things that you know, if a practitioner or um, you know, a medical professional doesn't have a lot of experience working with a child with autism, you might have to then step in and help understand that you might have to prompt in those situations you might have to help your child through that. Um, and so once we identify that, you know, maybe we don't have some of these skills, that's when the next step kind of comes into play. We're going to prepare and plan for success. So before, you know, we get into teaching those skills that we don't maybe have yet or really overcoming those fears, I want to make sure that um, you as the parent or guardian in that situation, you're prepared for that appointment and we can prepare anyone else, anyone else that's involved. So for example, um, you should be able to, you know, gather that information. So information as far as where you're going to go, what medical building are you going to, what room are you going to, who are you going to see and what is going to be done that day. I think those are really good things for you to know that way then you can help prepare your child. Um, gathering materials. So do you have all of the necessary documentation, um, insurance card if that's appropriate, um, any sort of diagnosis materials, things like that that are going to help with that transition from, you know, that waiting room or check-in back to the doctor and make things very seamless for, for you as, as far as that goes. Um, and then the last step there is to prepare others that are involved. So, you know, notify your medical professional if this is someone new that you're going to see, um, you know, that your child has, you know, a diagnosis. If your child does not have a diagnosis, but does present some of these challenging behaviors, letting them know, hey, last time you were here or last time you were in this situation, 
this happened and I wanna make sure that we make you aware of that as well. Um, so then after you kind of prepare yourself and everyone that's involved, I want to help you guys learn how to you know, plan for success in those situations. So the first one, you know, we want to identify and define what does success look like for you guys in that situation. Um, maybe that means we walk out of the dentist office without crying. Maybe that means that we walk into the dental office all by ourselves, identifying what would be a success for you and your family in that situation, and then making a goal based on that. So remembering that, you know, starting with those small goals, um, is going to be a little bit easier rather than trying to obtain this huge massive goal if we aren't ready for that we're just setting our ourselves and our child up for you know failure and that is not what we want to do rather we want to plan for that success um, so an example would be if you know our goal is that our child walks into the dentist office all by himself then we're going to make maybe a small goal where maybe first he walks out of the car or steps out of the car all by himself without any challenging behavior in order then to walk with mom into the dental office. Um, as you meet those smaller goals, you get to then move on to those larger, um, more comprehensive goals that we're looking for. All right, so these are a few strategies that I um, kind of have come up with based on, you know, some research and some, you know, practical experience um, relating to that idea of preparing and planning for those situations. So one of the first strategies that I think is, you know, awesomely applicable is that idea of reading a social story. There are so many social stories that are out on the internet. Um, there's also, you know, some um, you know blank social story templates that you can use and cater to your own child into the you know specific appointment that we're looking for. Um, these social stories can be really helpful in um, you know walking through and talking about what that situation might look like, um, how you might react or or behave in those situations. Um, it's a really awesome tool. Uh, the next strategy is um, having your having your child have an active role in helping with scheduling. So maybe, you know, you sit down with a calendar with your kiddo and you let them decide, you know, maybe you give them a few options um, within kind of your control of, you know, when would you like to have your dentist appointment or, you know, we could do this. Um, doctor's appointment on Thursday or Friday, which one do you want to kind of do? Giving them a little bit more say in, you know, what that might look like for them. The third one kind of ties into that as well, right? That idea of using visuals or previews of what to expect. That calendar, writing it on the calendar that we have the appointment on Thursday might serve as a great visual for your child as well. There are other types of visuals and previews that we can use. Off to the right of the screen here, you'll see um, a visual of kind of a dentist office um, appointment. So this visual kind of goes through all of the steps that might be involved. So the first one, you know, we're going to walk in the door, we're going to hang up our coat, we're going to walk into the waiting room, after we're done in the waiting room, we're going to sit in the dentist chair, etc. So it kind of gives kids a visual idea of what exactly is going to happen in those situations. Uh, the fourth one there is speaking with that provider beforehand about what the appointment will look like. Um, I kind of noted on this before when we talked about, you know, telling your provider that this is, you know, your previous experience or maybe this is our first time, um, but also getting their input on what that appointment might look like. Um, that way you can help them identify and use those visuals to really specifically get at what that child might experience during that appointment. It's always a great idea to use and bring plenty of reinforcers or you know, those preferred activities that you might use throughout the appointment. Um, maybe there's a specific time in the um, appointment, for example, maybe it is you know, opening our mouth or counting our teeth. That's what we really struggle with. Again, if we use that information from when we assess the situation, now we can plan. I am going to give a reinforcer after we're all done counting our teeth because that's something he really struggles with. So maybe letting um, your child know, you know, 
you know, if, you know, we sit through counting our teeth, then we get access to, you know, maybe a favorite game or a favorite fidget or something like that. Um, and then finally, I would always walk into these situations with, you know, a plan with your provider for, you know, an alternative plan or a termination criteria is what we like to call it um, in the world of ABA. Um, basically a plan if, you know, something goes really awry, what is our action plan? What steps are we going to take in order to assure that, you know, the child is safe and that we can still, um, you know, make sure that this is a productive appointment. All right, that third step then is going to be, you know, finally practicing. So when I say that we're going to practice, I want to take the time to practice the, you know, steps or practice these skills in a familiar environment. What we might do is write down what we call a task analysis or step by step. Um, a list of that procedure or what that appointment might look like. Um, if you remember in the previous step, we talked about, you know, talking with the provider about what exactly to expect during that session um, or that appointment, and then maybe using that visual. Now we're going to apply those and use those as um, kind of a model for how we're going to practice these things in that familiar environment, whether that is at home, um, in an ABA session, in daycare, preschool, whatever that, you know, is going to look like for you and your family. Um, when we are, you know, practicing these things in, you know, the home setting, I want to make sure that we are, you know, providing breaks um, pretty frequently, especially if we are teaching a new skill. Um, and then also providing those opportunities for reinforcement or opportunities for a break with, you know, a favorite activity or maybe a break with a favorite snack, making sure that we are making sure that this is a, a good environment, a good practice session for the child. Um, another great strategy to use when we're practicing is to model what the skill looks like for your child. Maybe you are working on um, you know, a, tolerating uh, someone else brushing your, brushing your teeth. Maybe you have, you know, another person come in, sit down, and you show them what it looks like to have someone else brush your teeth. After you model that with another individual to your child, then it's your child's turn to practice. You know, now you're going to sit in the chair and I'm going to brush your teeth. Um, modeling what that appropriate behavior looks like. You can also use um, YouTube videos. Um, before this presentation, I was going through um, on YouTube and there are a lot of really cool videos that model um, dental medical appointments um, for children. And I think this is also a really good tool, especially since, you know, children learn very, very quickly. And they're also, you know, more keen to watch a video versus, you know, me try to brush, you know, someone else's teeth. Um, another key point is to remember that, you know, if we practice this one time, they might do well in the next situation. However, if we practice it, you know, four, five, 10 times at home, we're more likely to then do better in that real or um, the actual situation. So remembering to practice several times and be consistent in your practice schedule. Um, if it's something that you really want to see some success and some progress with, you're definitely gonna have to practice more than one time. Um, another thing that I would really recommend and that we use um, pretty commonly in um, applied behavior analysis is this idea of graduated exposure. Um, it's also sometimes um, related to um, program desensitization. It's this idea of slowly and gradually exposing your child to a situation that they might not like right now. Um, this idea of reinforcing those small itty bitty steps. And as we reinforce, we expand or we increase the amount of something that we have to tolerate or the amount of something we have to do. I have an example here on the next page of what graduated exposure might look like for a child who might have some trouble um, tolerating a stethoscope or, you know, a doctor listening to their heartbeat. So 
as I mentioned, it's this idea of slow and gradual exposure. So um, kind of breaking this down into very small building blocks that build upon each other. This first one here is that the child will simply tolerate having the stethoscope on the table in front of him or her. Once we have mastered that, we're definitely okay with having that stethoscope, you know, on the table near us. Then we might move on to the next step, having the child tolerate an adult holding the stethoscope while standing next to him or her. Again, once we have mastered that one, we move on to, you know, moving that gradually and slowly next to them on their chest and having it there for longer periods of time. You would continue this process until um, you meet kind of, again, your, your end goal, that big goal that you might have. So maybe that is that the child will tolerate the adult holding a stethoscope to the chest for an entire, you know, two minutes. It, I don't think it typically lasts two minutes, but, you know, maybe you work towards that as your goal. That way in the doctor's office, they can handle it if, um, you know, it takes a little bit longer than expected. All right, and then finally, so our fourth step is to then, you know, after we've done all of our practicing in home, it's then to generalize or move that skill into the natural environment. So this is gonna include practicing in other environments, including, you know, where the appointment is actually going to take place. Maybe you practice it in another room of the house. Maybe we're working on, you know, getting our blood pressure read. Maybe we've always been practicing it in the bathroom. Maybe we move into a different bathroom in the house or we move into the kitchen. That way they're understanding that, hey, I don't just tolerate this well in the bathroom, but I can do this in other, in other rooms as well, in other places. Um, another great recommendation for um, working on this generalization piece is to take a trip to um, you know, the office or the medical building when the child isn't sick or needing any procedures. So this is the idea of pairing that appointment or that experience with other positive experiences. If we take our child to the doctor when they aren't sick at all, maybe they're just going in to say hi to the doctor and getting reinforcement or gaining access to all of these great things that they like they're gonna to start to associate, hey, I go to the doctor and great things can happen too. Um, same thing is applicable for you know, the dentist or any other medical professional. Um, if it's possible to arrange this, by all means. <laughs> if it's not, which I understand it might not feasibly be um, something that everyone can do, maybe you take a trip to just outside the dentist's office. Maybe you take a trip to outside the hospital. Maybe you walk to the door and you walk back to the car. Maybe something like that. Um, and then of course, we're gonna try to practice then in the actual environment. We've done all of this practice outside of our, you know, outside of the actual setting, whether that is in the home or at school or in ABA sessions. Now we want to actually put these kids in these natural situations and, and you know, utilize all of the strategies that we have talked about. Um, and remembering to, of course, like we mentioned, provide lots of opportunities for reinforcement, frequent breaks. And then I think the most important thing is to be consistent. If there is a strategy that you've been using when you practiced at home, or there is something specific that you have provided as you know, a break or for a source of reinforcement during your practice sessions, be sure to use that in the generalization sessions or in that actual environment as well. Um, there are also a few additional tips that didn't quite fit into all of these categories or one of these categories and I wanted to kind of mention them. So as I was going through, there were a lot of um, really awesome tips that I thought should be noted. The first one being, you know, scheduling that appointment either really early in the morning or after lunch. Um, sometimes kiddos do better, you know, after their tummies are full or, you know, it's the first thing that we have to do in the day. That way they're not sitting worrying about it or, um, you know, thinking about it all day versus we get it out of the way and we can move on with our day. 
Um, something for parents to consider is making a list of questions or concerns prior to the visit. So having those lists of questions in front of you helps with that transition while maybe the doctor is asking you, do you have questions? And, you know, your child maybe is engaging in challenging behavior or you're trying to, you know, maybe de-escalate the situation again. You know, having that list in front of you, you can either, you know, hand the doctor your list. You could always do, um, you know, uh, a drop off with, you know, another person takes a child for a while while you talk to the doctor. But, you know, having that idea of, you know, kind of planning ahead, having that list as a prompt there for you, I think is also going to be beneficial. Um, taking an extra adult with to help. Um, like I mentioned in my last point, I think having another adult there to kind of assist if, you know, something were to, you know, go wrong or the extra adult can help, you know, interact with the child while maybe you are, you know, answering questions from the doctor or you are providing um, medical information to the, to the nurse as well. The fourth one is to ask for a follow-up phone call. So rather than, you know, the doctor coming back into the room, letting you know, um, this, is, this is what we found, or this is what we need to do next. Rather, maybe ask for a phone call. That way your child isn't being exposed to, you know, maybe the doctor saying, well, we have to do another shot or, you know, something similar to that. I think, you know, asking for a phone call as a follow-up might be a good benefit to um, both you, your time, and your child as well. Um, you might consider notifying the staff ahead of time of specific triggers your, your child might have. As I mentioned, children with autism definitely have, um, you know, other, um, other symptoms to identify and to work with. So triggers such as, you know, bright lights or flashing lights. Um, any loud noises, things like that that might trigger them, it's, it's great to notify the staff ahead of time. That way they can kind of work and, and make sure that that is something that we won't have to worry about on top of those other medical fears that they might have. Um, you might also request specific staff. So maybe last time you were at the doctor's office, you had this nurse and she did really well with doing this. You can always request to have a specific staff work with your child. If that's something that's not feasible for the doctor's office, at least try to make that request and, and see if they can accommodate that. Um, arriving early to the appointment, I think this is applicable for everyone, but especially in those situations where, you know, maybe that transition into the doctor's office is a really hard one for your child. If you allow a little bit more time, that is going to make, you know, your life a little bit easier, a little less stressful, as well as for your child. Um, another really great um, tip that I came across was to take a tour before the appointment. If, if this is um, a medical building or a medical appointment you've never been to before, asking for a tour before the appointment. That way your child can see, you know, where they're gonna go, maybe meeting the doctor ahead of time. It's also a great opportunity to, in our last slide, pair that appointment with, you know, positive experiences of, I don't have to have anything done today. I'm gonna go meet my doctor. I'm gonna go look around at the hospital or, um, you know, the dentist office and, you know, I get maybe a cool reinforcer or access to, you know, my favorite, toy after the appointment because I did a great job. Um, I mentioned earlier in the slideshow that a lot of these tips and tricks are not only um, applicable to medical appointments, but they can also be applicable to things such as, you know, getting a haircut, having our fingernails or toenails trimmed, um, something as, you know, as applicable as wearing a life jacket. I think that, you know, that idea of gradual exposure can be super beneficial to something like wearing a life jacket. Um, taking a bath, wearing a mask, um, especially in, you know, today's day and age, wearing a mask is something that a lot of kids don't want to do. Um, but again, that idea of graduated exposure could be very beneficial in doing this. Um, I've worked with several kiddos where, you know, we work from a child, you know, holding a mask out in front of them to them holding a mask on their face to them wearing a mask for upwards of, you know, 20, 30 minutes. 
um, situations like taking medications, um, tolerating having eye drops put in or, you know, sitting through an eye exam, going on an airplane, um, taking a trip to a restaurant or even family pictures. All of these things can be super, super beneficial with, you know, some of these strategies as well. All right, and then finally, I had a few additional resources that I kind of wanted to share with you guys as well here. What I'm gonna do is, I am going to stop sharing just for a second here. And we're gonna bring some of these resources up. That way I can show you. And then you guys will also have access to these um, after the presentation as well. So I'll go ahead and share here again. All right. So this first link that you saw was related to um, Autism Speaks. It's a great resource for um, parents with children with autism. It has great resources that range from, um, you know, just how to overcome challenging behaviors to how to present instructions, all the way to, you know, how to tackle doctor visits. Um, the specific article that I linked is related to um, a pediatrician here at, you know, the Thompson Center. She kind of walks through some, you know, more tips and tricks as far as um, preparing your child for specifically doctor's visits. And then she has lots of really great resources linked below um, that I wanted to make sure that I brought to your guys' attention as well. Um, the other one that I had linked for you guys was another Autism Speaks article, um, but within here they talk about, you know, specific tips and tricks for dental appointments as well. Um, there are also, there's also this really cool resource, um, they send a dental toolkit where your kiddo has access to dental equipment to practice these things at home. There's also some forms and things to help kind of prepare you for those appointments as well. All right. And then, lastly, there were two other resources that were on there. They are just links to um, some kids, doctors, and dental kits that you can use in home to practice some of those things. So um, one of the biggest questions that I always get after a presentation like this is, you know, we'd love to work on, you know, blood pressure or, um, you know, having our ears checked or our temperature checked, but it's not that parents always have access to those materials. Um, and so one thing that I like to do with our really little kiddos is getting a kid's doctor kit and practicing with those things and then gradually moving to more realistic tools. Um, so those are linked down there as well as a social story example for taking your child or preparing your child to go to the doctor. Um, this is a template that can be used um, and made applicable for, you know, dental appointments, haircuts, whatever you kind of want, you can use this as a template for creating your own. Um, there's also so many resources on the internet. If you just, um, you know, do a quick Google search of social stories for, you know, going to the doctor or social stories for getting a haircut, there are lots and lots of great resources out there as well. All right, well, um, I wanted to give you guys my contact information as well. Um, my email is on there, it is rebbers at bpiaba.com. Um, if you have any other you know, questions, feel free to you know, send an email, give us a phone call over at BPI. We'd be more than happy to help you with you know, navigating these um, medical appointment fears with you and your child. Um, and then lastly, I'll kind of open things up for questions. If anyone has, you know, any questions that they have for me, we can go ahead and, and kind of answer those at this time. So there is that contact information for you guys as well. Yeah, that sounds great. Well, thank you so much. I can see where a lot of these tools could help in, like you said, in various scenarios in life. Uh, as your child navigates the medical facility and, and haircuts as well. Yeah. So that's good. 
Um, so we thank you all for coming. This was recorded, so it'll be up uh, on our YouTube channel, our parenting YouTube channel in a few days. And so you can revisit it or share it out uh, to your friends that couldn't be here. Thanks a lot, Rebecca. Thank you, Sarah.